On this episode, we sit down with Jean-Paul Seninger, the Luxembourgian ambassador to Thailand. So if you want to learn more about the relationship between Thailand and a tiny, lovely European duchy, you'll dig this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawa de Krupp, and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 for the beaches, food, weather, and cost of living, but ended up staying for the beaches, food, weather, and cost of living. There you go. Sometimes things work out. It worked out pretty well, yeah. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract almost 22 years ago, fell in love with Thai parliamentary backlogs that accidentally result in unexpected liberalism. So I never left. It's like when you complain about corruption and then when corruption works in your favor, you're like, oh, actually, it's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in this case, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I think it was just confusion. But uh, as we mentioned in the show last week, uh, there's we have a window. Who knows how long it's going to last? A window of freedom and liberalism. So I'll, I'll take what I can get. Right. We want to give a big thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a whole bunch of cool stuff, including our ad-free regular show a day early, emails with behind-the-scenes photos of our interviews, access to our Discord server to chat with me, Greg, and other listeners around the world, and various other goodies. But best of all, patrons also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and Bangkok topics. We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and we chatted about Greg's valiant but ultimately futile efforts to avoid COVID and how he deals with quarantine in a small condo. Spoiler, not well. <laughs> right. In other words, Greg got got. I got got. Yeah. He did. The end of the mask mandate, if you're walking around outside in Bangkok, my late night adventure in Koreatown that gave me hope for the future of Bangkok's nightlife, and some thoughts on our favorite show on tv the boys which is definitely not safe for work to learn how to become a patron click the support button at the top of our website right and as always if you have something interesting to say or a show idea or a joke or just want to say hi head to bangkokpodcast.com and click the little microphone button on the bottom right to leave us a voicemail that we'll play on the show and uh we're speaking of that we have one to play at the end of the show but um, I also want to read a little message I got here. Ed is a nice little message from one of our listeners named Paul. And uh, it's it's nothing uh, too deep or long, but it's short and sweet. But it did warm my cockles. And this is the kind of stuff we like to get from our listeners. He says, uh, hi, Greg and Ed. My name is Paul, and I'm a longtime listener. I'm currently visiting Bangkok. It is truly an amazing city. I want to thank you for your podcast. It has made my visit to Thailand much more rewarding. Thank you so much. I it's love nice. Paul. I like Paul. I just want to say. I like Paul. Yeah, he seems... Sounds like, like a great guy. Kind of guy. Sounds like a great guy. Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of feedback we need. We need. We don't, it doesn't have to be long and uh, and and dense. That's all it needs. Short, sweet, and positive. That's how we like it. <laughs> all right. Well, in this episode, we are delighted to sit down with the Honorable Jean Paul Seninger, who is the Luxembourgian ambassador to Thailand. Now, we've had a series of conversations with ambassadors over the past few seasons, and I really enjoy the ones who represent countries that are not always on the front page of the papers, and Luxembourg is one of them. Now, for those that don't know, Luxembourg is a landlocked country that borders Belgium, Germany, and France, and one of those beautiful, wealthy, historical destinations that always makes me want to pack my bag and head to Europe. But I was really curious what the relationship between it and Thailand was, because they don't seem to have a ton in common. In fact, despite being about a thousand square kilometers bigger than Bangkok, Luxembourg has only 650,000 people. So that's your first incredible difference. Wow. Man, can you imagine 650,000 people in a place a thousand square kilometers bigger than Bangkok? That'd be nice. So we invited Ambassador Seninger onto the show to talk about his role as a diplomat, some of Luxembourg's surprising contributions to global tech and commerce, and why diplomacy by any other name would smell as sweet. So here is my conversation with the Honorable Jean-Paul Seninger. (laughs) 
All right. Well, we are very happy to be talking to uh, a young fellow by the name of Jean-Paul Seninger. He is the Luxembourgian ambassador to Thailand. So Jean-Paul, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure being with you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you too. And I want to say a little bit about how this came to be. I mean, we are doing a little bit of a ambassador uh, series on the podcast here, and I'm I'm slowly working my way through the ambassadorial ranks in in Bangkok. I just find I find it really interesting to to learn about Thailand's relationship with other countries around the world. And a very good friend of mine was was in town recently, and I told her about the podcast. My friend Nadine, and uh, I said. She said, why don't you interview the Luxembourgian ambassador? I used to work for him at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I was like, hey, that's a great idea. <laughs> Proof that we're living in a small interconnected world, don't we? We are, yeah. We used to work together about, about 18 years ago. So, yeah. so sh- shout out to my friend Nadine. So let's, uh, let's learn a little bit more about yourself. How did you come to Thailand? Uh, what's your education like? Where were you posted before this? Tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, before before coming to, to Thailand, I was actually based in Luxembourg for uh, seven years, uh, five years as uh, five last years as Secretary General of the government, so working in close cooperation with the, the Prime Minister and, and the government, and the two previous years as Secretary General of Foreign Affairs, so in charge of coordinating our diplomatic service and uh, uh, to some extent as an assistant to the Minister of, uh, of Foreign Affairs. Prior to okay. that, uh, I was based as ambassador in in Washington D.C., in Madrid, and in in Turkey, and of course in between, back at headquarters or capital punishment, if you want uh, <laughs> to call it that way. <laughs> wow! So you've got a lot of experience under your belt. Then those sound like pretty interesting posts. Is 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 Thailand considered like a, a what do they call it a, um, a, a hardship posting or an, what's the opposite of that? It's it's considered sort of like a reward for excellent service. Well, Thailand is certainly a very attractive and afterthought <laughs> uh, post um, because, of course, well, you're in a friendly environment, you're in a nice climate. Uh, that's at least what we are told, and that and, and it has proven to be to be the case. For, for, for Luxembourg, uh, our embassy in Bangkok is somewhat of a strange animal because it's a regional embassy, meaning that we are not only in charge of relations with, uh, with Thailand, but also with a whole series of, of countries in the region, seven countries in the region, um, which makes it, if you want to, kind of a hardship post, but then again, a very interesting uh, posting because you deal with very different subjects and problems uh, because you have this variety of, of countries uh, between uh, Singapore, very developed, uh, vibrant uh, economy with financial uh, services that, are of course, interesting to us and, and a real uh, regional hub. Thailand, again, a very developed economy, a regional, a, a regional hub. And on the other hand, countries that are struggling a little bit to, to catch up, like uh, Laos, uh, or until briefly uh, Myanmar, which is, of course, now in a very difficult situation after, yeah. after the coup. And in between, countries like Vietnam that are doing extremely fine in catching up with their economic uh, development. So you can imagine that this for... A diplomat is uh, a very interesting posting to be able to deal with these different en- environments. But of course, it's also it's also very demanding. Uh, mm-hmm. Not yeah, only that. not only on me, but uh, even more so on my team because uh, I'm of course chasing them to go after uh, <laughs> all <laughs> all the good opportunities right. and possibilities and uh, catch up with. Uh, evolutions in in the region so uh, it's it's certainly rewarding and a, a gift to be able to uh, represent my country and defend our interests and the interests of uh, our uh, economic sector and uh, our companies in this very vibrant part of the world that's yeah. the Southeast Asia do you find it difficult then? Because a lot of countries, I mean, I'm from Canada and we've had the Canadian ambassador on before. And, you know, she represents Cambodia and Laos as well. 
Do you find it difficult to, uh, you know, wear those different hats to switch off your Singapore ambassador hat and then put on your Cambodia ambassador hat or whatever, to, you know, going back and forth to these very different cultures and economic realities of these different countries? Oh, yes, it's it's definitely a challenge. And you have, uh, especially in our case, we have to prioritize and decide what are the issues and, and, and the subject that we want to really put mm. our, our focus on. Yeah. But at, at the same time, it's, it's truly, truly rewarding. And uh, I, I choose the, to, to come here because I wanted to have uh, this feel that you can work in a diverse environment and experience right, right. Different, different cultures. It can, be, it can be challenging. And it was difficult to a certain extent during the pandemic when you were not allowed to to travel and to meet people that you should otherwise uh, meet and work together so to some extent we went and to 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 digital platforms and uh, uh, virtual conferences and well they are all useful tools but they do not replace uh, the real right. face-to-face meeting that after all, it's the essence of diplomacy to, to meet people, to exchange views, to explore yeah. opportunities. And this you do in a much more efficient way when you can, when you can meet people and not, not through. Um, a, a screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of people like to try to be diplomatic, but in your case, it's actually your job title. You know, you, you have to are an actual diplomat. The very yeah, yeah. definition of the word. <laughs> but but at the same time, as I mentioned, being in charge of a regional embassy under normal circumstances, we have to prioritize and and say, well, this week, do I go, do I go to to Singapore or? is maybe Hanoi more important. Mm, right, uh, right. During COVID times now, well, we, we didn't have the depth of uh, the exchanges and the discussions. Uh, but on the other hand, I was able to be in Singapore in the morning and in Hanoi in the afternoon uh, <laughs> yeah. and and back in the evening in, 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 uh, in Bangkok. So right. uh, it's not entirely white and, and, and black. There are a lot of sure. shades of gray in, in, in between. Yeah, yeah. So so tell me a little bit about the, the diplomatic history between Thailand and Luxembourg then. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm from Canada, which is a geographically massive country, but we're sort of so overshadowed by our neighbor that a lot of people sometimes forget about us. So when, you know, uh, it talks about, you know, when Thailand is talking about their trade partners, of course, you think things like Germany or France or these big, big countries. So I, I think maybe a lot of people might not know about the history between Thailand and Luxembourg. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, when you talk about history, we are, of course, in the very favorable situation and in the past due to our geographic distance and the difference in dimensions as well. Luxembourg and, and Thailand never had any stressful situations, like we never went to war with, the, with one another. <laughs> uh, but, of course, the that's that's not the way you should look at at relations, and certainly not the way we look at relations nowadays. Because uh, in the interconnected world that we are living in, we, we are everybody's neighbors. So uh, geography is no no longer as important as it uh, as it used to, as it used to be. Right. And and you have to consider as well that when it comes to economic and even political relations, you cannot distinguish exactly between the different European countries. We are one massive trading block, and the EU is has has become a very important trading partner for for Thailand and and the neighboring countries as well, and and that reflects also on. The, the smaller membership, member states, sorry, like, uh, like Luxembourg, because it, within the division of labor, of course, well, we are an integral part of, uh, of these, uh, these exchanges. So what, what kind of economic relation does, does Thailand have with, with Luxembourg? What kind of things do you trade most and what are your biggest imports, exports and, 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 and what projects are you working on to, to advance that relationship? You might be aware that Luxembourg is uh, home to several large global companies that uh, are really success uh, stories on a global uh, global platform, the world's largest 
uh, all cargo airline is based in Luxembourg. It's a Luxembourgish company by the name of Cargo Lux. And uh, if I'm well informed, well, they have like what 30, 32 rotations per week uh, uh, out of uh, out of Bangkok. So uh, wow. uh, Bangkok has become uh, one of their regional hubs here in in. Southeast Asia, bringing in all kinds of goods, flying flying out all all kinds of goods. So all right. that's one of one of the important vectors of, of our interaction. Another one, SES uh, Société Européenne des Satellites, the world's largest uh, satellite company, providing connectivity and, and and television and radio programs and whatever to the globe. Oh. Um, if I'm well informed, they operate some 40 satellites right now. And of course, some also with a specific scope for for this part of, of the world. So uh, when you look at, at the economy of Luxembourg, you, you have to look at companies that are successful globally uh, because they do not consider Luxembourg or even the region or even Europe as their home market. But coming from a smaller country, if you want to succeed, well, you have to be uh, to be better than your neighbors in their home territory, and you have to uh, to conceive your business plan and model uh, not for a small territory, but for uh, going global and and succeed uh, globally. But then again, we yeah. we also want to focus on uh, people to people relations. Uh, we've been successfully attracting uh, students from this region to. The University of Luxembourg and developed economic and academic and research uh, relations. So it's a complex and comprehensive uh, relations as with, as with any other country. Right, right. And I think that's interesting. I mean, it's easy to sort of say like, oh, trade between two countries is, is uh, you know, cheese comes over here and then uh, Thai beef goes over there or something like that, something very traditional. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you could even say boring. But when you talk about uh, you know, cargo and the satellite signal that you watch your t- your phone with, you know, these are the things that people might not even realize or think about, but they have to come from somewhere. Uh, and some of them come from Luxembourg. So there you go. And when you look at a car, well, you might say, well, this is a, a French car or a German car, but the components come from all over the world. And we're just right now okay. experiencing this uh, this difficulties with the interruption of global logistics uh, that that's affecting all our economies in more or less the same the same way because we are so interconnected. You talked a little bit about the University of Luxembourg and, and, and Thais going over there. How do you pitch Luxembourg to to Thais who might sort of again be focused on more like traditional destinations like Germany or or the UK? Well, there again, we have a fantastic uh, cooperation between our European embassies here in in Bangkok. And uh, just the last weekend, we had organized by the French presidency. Uh, of, of the of the union, a special uh, day dedicated to study in Europe, as we as we called us, and we had twelve countries from from the European Union participating, showcasing their oh, wow. uh, universities, their exchange programs. Uh, so it, it's become increasingly a European effort when we tend to to promote ourselves because. It, it's easy to try and promote uh, one country, but it's far more successful if you can promote the diversity and, and the richness of uh, the European Union with all the different uh, right. languages, uh, approaches. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Now, that leads me to wonder, though, um, I mean, that makes a lot of sense from 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 just a sort of a logistical, uh, s- making everything easier point of view. Does someone in your position or does someone from your boss's position back in Europe, do they see the same thing from Thailand? Like we were saw, talking about earlier, uh, ASEAN countries are very unequal in terms mm-hmm. of economic power and, and ability and things like that. So do they see a similar united front from ASEAN or is it more like Thailand is reaching out or Vietnam is reaching out? I think this the, the, the same applies to uh, to ASEAN when uh, of course when you want to uh, to promote ASEAN as one single block you're 
rapidly aware that it's not an integrated market to the same extent as the European uh, single single market would be. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I've just returned right. now from, from Luxembourg uh, two weeks ago where we organize uh, every every year what we call the ASEAN Days. So it's a special fair dedicated to promoting the different countries of Southeast Asia with our companies and our and our uh, business leaders. But not only, o- also we're trying to duplicate what we do successfully here in in Bangkok as uh, as European embassies joining forces between our business sector and the different ASEAN embassies in in, in Luxembourg and in our region mm. and bring all the actors together because there again you show a far more complete picture of what's uh, of what the the reality and the possibilities uh, are than if you're just trying to put the focus on 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 one country yeah exactly yeah that it, it, it makes sense to to approach that together um but uh, it's it takes a level of coordination and uh communication that i think maybe may, you might not always see so openly displayed that's what diplomats are paid for to to coordinate to reach out <laughs> to speak to 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 colleagues and friends and uh, even to those who are not yet colleagues and friends. So how many more years do you have left here? And, and what do you want to accomplish personally in, in your role before you leave? Well, we, we all serve at the pleasure of our, uh, of our government. So uh, normally a posting for us is uh, four or sometimes five, five years in a post like, like Bangkok. Considering I've been here now for, for three years, even if two of them were somewhat affected by, by COVID, <laughs> um, well, let's say I, I can imagine the end of my, of my posting being not too far away. But you know, have you? I guess uh, two years of sort of, uh, I don't know if they've reduced the effectiveness of the, of the role of the diplomat. But um, it's, it sounds like you're still managing to get a lot of a lot of work done and, and make some inroads into the areas you'd like to to affect and, and have positive outcomes in. Well, we've we've certainly not been able to reach out to as many people in the most effective way, the way we we would have wanted to, and we have to blame Kun COVID for that. That's that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but. On, on the other hand, well, we've not been sitting here idle doing nothing, uh, just as just as right. our colleagues around the world have not uh, the impression that it's uh, two completely lost years. We've, uh, but of course, we are also mm-hmm. very much looking forward to our countries and all the other countries opening up again and being able to to reach out and right. meet people in person. I can say that in podcasting too. I mean, you and I are talking online right now, but uh, two years ago, this would have been really, really the uh, the sort of like last resort. Uh, it's always better to meet people and chat in person, but doing it online, it seems to be a, an acceptable alternative. At least we can still do it. And to job. some extent, we get used to it. Yeah. And that again, makes it makes yeah. it not only easier and more acceptable, but in the end, also a little bit more efficient. I think the only losers from this are going to be the airlines who won't be selling as many business class uh, seats for annual conferences and, and <laughs> things like that. If the, the climate is the winner on the other, on the other hand, I'm, <laughs> right. I'm absolutely willing that the airlines will have to, to suffer a little bit because uh, our, up, our yeah. planet and we all are seriously suffering from climate change. And that's because you mentioned the the area that I would want to focus on. It's uh, uh, strengthen yeah. the collaboration uh, between uh, Luxembourg and Thailand and, and the region when it comes to circular economy, to green finance, to uh, sustainable production methods where we can exchange our experiences and our projects. And in that area particularly, Luxembourg certainly has to to offer all the expertise and, and possibilities of green finance where the Luxembourg Stock Exchange has developed into uh, the leading platform for green and sustainable finance worldwide. Oh. 
even in COVID, during COVID times, we were uh, successful in attracting the first uh, Thai sovereign green bond to be listed as well at the stock exchange in Luxembourg and, oh, and wow. getting the, the the approval that it matches the uh, the standards and the prerequisites of the market for this kind of uh, uh, financial instruments. Cool, cool. All right. Well, good. Good to see progress being made there for sure. Because I think in fifty years we're, we 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 might not even be here anymore. We might have to move the city a little bit north or, or something. <laughs> So uh, wrapping up then, as, as we're getting ready to go here, I, you know, I was, as I was reading up uh, on Luxembourg a little bit before our call, uh, and this, this might not even be worth mentioning, but I thought it was kind of interesting. You know, Thailand always, always says that uh, they've never been colonized. They're very proud of the fact that out of all of Southeast Asia, they're the only ones that's never been colonized. And I read a little bit about Luxembourg. Um, it's the world's only remaining sovereign grand duchy. Is is that is is that a similarly unique cultural touch point that Luxembourgians uh, are proud of, are proud of? I'm not even sure what it means, but it sounds pretty. Interesting. <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, the form of your government is the most important, uh, and if your monarchy, your uh, constitutional monarchy, is called uh, uh, an empire, in, as in the case of Japan, which might. Which might be the only remaining empire, no? if I'm not mistaken. Is it still an empire? Well, they still have an emperor, so it's still an empire. Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah. Uh, or a kingdom, uh, or a grand duke. Because, well, what's the difference between a grand duke and a king? Uh, I've I've never understood where uh, the the difference the difference was. But to me, what is essential and where all uh, Luxembourgers are certainly proud of is it's it's not living in a grand duchy because that that's not the important thing, but what what's important to us is that we live in a uh, multicultural open country and an open and diverse society. Uh, when you look at the the population of, of Luxembourg, you will notice that some fifty percent do not hold the Luxembourgish passport. When you when you look at the city of Luxembourg, the capital, uh, it would certainly be around 70%. And taking it from there, I think we should be proud that all these people, uh, 130 some nationalities, are living together in peace, in harmony, working together, cooperating in a very dynamic way, creating one of the most vibrant e economies in in Europe and creating an economy that's prosperous and providing excellent social services and benefits for all the residents, all the inhabitants. I think that's a, a, a reason to be really proud of. The fact, well, that it's uh, the only remaining Grand Duchy might be a good advertising tool, but <laughs> it's it's not it's it's not that important in in the end. It's important uh, how how people feel about their country, and and when I say people, it's not just nationals. It's all the residents, all all these people that have uh, made Luxembourg their home, that thrive there, that are happy to to raise their their families there and make it a community. Right. Wise words from an experienced diplomat. Yeah. A rose by any other name will smell as sweet, right? Whether it's a, an emperor or a king or a, or a grand duke. <laughs> well, sir, I'll let you go with that. Thank you very much for giving us your thoughts on uh, – on, on on Luxembourg and Thailand, yeah. and uh, I hope I hope the rest of your posting here is not as as uh, weird as the last few years have been for you and all of us too. <laughs> so, well, I, uh, these have been until now best. very interesting and rewarding years, and I'm and I'm looking forward to the month and years ahead, and I'm absolutely sure that they will be even even more interesting and even even more rewarding. So, thank you so much for uh, this interesting discussion. Thank you. Man, sounds like an interesting guy. I mean, Luxembourg is one of those countries that I, you know, I, I've personally never been to Europe, but I've read about it. I know something about it. But what a unique place. You know, it's, it's small, yeah, but it's right yeah. there in the middle of Europe. It's in the middle of Western history. 
Exactly, exactly. And it's just, it's it's such a, a I don't know, man, Come a small town Canadian boy, Europe as a whole is just sort of like this romantic historical place. And then um, sure. you, you drill down into places like Luxembourg and just fascinating history and the people. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to just th- think about how all of these different countries have to figure out a way to relate to Thailand. I mean, I, I have met some of the ambassadors that we have interviewed, but you, you, you're taking the lead on this. And I don't know how many ambassadors you've actually interviewed, but it's a lot, man. Yeah, it's, it's hopefully hopefully many more to come. But the ones the ones that I have talked to have always been you know really really nice, interesting, intelligent, and a great way for for us as uh, you know podcast hosts to get to learn a little bit more about the world, which which ain't never a bad thing. You know, as expats, we care about just surviving and being happy in Thailand, just as an individual, as a normal citizen. But every country in the world like has relationships with Thailand officially. So I like this uh, that uh, you know. I, I like that on the podcast we're we're doing like the street level stuff, but we're also doing the higher level stuff, man. We got we got all the levels covered. That's right. We roll with everyone. It's like me in high school. Like I was friends with the jocks, and I was friends with the nerds. <laughs> you know, it's it's. I, I like that we have. I like that they're willing to come on the show and talk to us because it's 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 formal and official. Even though the ones that I've met and the ones you've talked to like seem to be pretty normal people. And that's part of what makes Bangkok so cool, right? Like it's. It's got this really unique texture that that we were able to talk to people that we probably would never be able to talk to if we were stuck back home. So that's what makes it so fun. Agreed. So, Agree 100%. Sure. Many thanks to the ambassador for coming on the show, sir. And uh, we'll hope to see you again. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Let's get into some love, loathe, or live with, where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we then discuss and decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept as something that we just have to learn to live with no matter how we feel about it. The last time Ed asked me what I thought about that traditional Thai music at Muay Thai matches. So this week it's my turn. Hit me. Now, Ed, what uh, you've lived in a few different places around around the town in your years here. A few different uh, I have. locations. I have, yes. What's your take on the almost mandatory presence of a Buddha shelf in your domicile? You know, the one that's up high on a wall somewhere that has statues of a Buddha or relics or flowers hanging off it of some type. What's, what's your take on this particular decoration? Great question. Uh, I, In short, I, 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 I like it. I definitely can handle it. Uh, so I, I'd probably put myself on a live with. I might be a love. I, I think it, I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. And I like the uh, habit of putting on a higher level for obvious reasons. Uh, I have a little bit of a, I have two little quick uh, anecdotes on this topic. Uh, right. Years ago, I mean, this is probably... Um, honestly, a long time ago, 15 years ago, I was with uh, my yoga teacher and we went up to a Utia to uh, take pictures. And uh, so I have a bunch of cool pictures, like him sitting in like full lotus in front of these old, you know, a uh, Utia era Buddha statues. But um, when he tried to do a handstand and have his feet higher than uh, these Buddha statues, the guards ran over Wow. Yeah, that's, that's a no-no. Personally, he's super respectful towards Buddhism. You know, he's a meditator. Um, but they didn't want a photograph taken where in the photo, the feet were higher than the Buddha image. Right. Fair enough. Yeah, I see. You understand? Yeah, I understand. Right. Um, and, then the other, and then the other twist is uh, I was in the States. Uh, uh, listeners, you might remember, uh, uh, I, I made a trip to upstate New York, saw a really good friend of mine. Uh, in upstate New York, where where I experienced a blizzard, <laughs> but um, randomly, randomly, he showed me a Buddha image that he had bought, which was a really cool Buddha image, uh, but it was sitting on the floor. Ooh, no, he, no, he no, like, no! You can't do that. That's exactly. You know, it was funny because I I kind of felt Thai, or I just felt like I had learned. You know, just he was like, "Dude, check this out!" And it was a really cool statue, and I was I was like man, you really, you, don't, you shouldn't really put that on the floor. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, as far as I know, that's, that's not cool. Or at least in Thailand, you would never put a Buddha image on the floor. And he was like, really? And he picked it up and put it on the table. And I'm like, yeah. And I explained to him this whole idea of a shelf and it really should be higher up. Uh, and Interesting. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. So may, maybe, maybe I got to put myself in the love category. It's the, I, 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 I like the concept of um, having an image that uh, for good reasons, 
like deserves respect. What can I say? I, I kind of agree with you there. I, I think I'll I, I would barely come down on love uh, from live with. Like to be honest, like I couldn't really care less if it's there or not there. If my wife came out one day and said I want to take that down, I'd be like, fine, I don't care. Yeah, um, you're, no, agreed, agreed. I mean, I'm not just to be clear. I'm not religious. I'm I'm literally an outspoken atheist. Whatever you know, just to be clear. So I'm not a religious person. Right. I think I think you're like me. It, it just it's just a nice reminder that we're living in a sort of exotic interesting culture where there are rules and, and, and cultural norms that we have to abide by that are that are interesting and reminds us that we're not at home. You know, of course, in a general sense, uh, I, I, I want to respect the local culture, but I think it goes a little bit beyond that. I mean, there's just something about the, the, the general reverence that Thai people have for the image. Like, so, so Thai people, to me, in general, as you know, are super laid back. They're not in your face about their religion and they they don't throw it at you. They don't um, proselytize. They're not evangelical. And the image is just there. It's up on the wall. Um, they don't ask a lot. They just ask that you don't disrespect the image. You know, it's right, like right. It's, you know what I'm saying? It's just, you know, so I kind of like that. So I like the fact that it's like they care about it. It's an image. It's there. It, but it's not shoved in your face. It's not like you don't have to get on your knees in front of it. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to bow down to it. Um, but it's there and it's, it's, it, uh, it's kind of ever present, like in yeah, Thai yeah, homes. Yeah. It's almost yeah. in every Thai home, right? Yeah, it's, it almost, it's almost mandatory. Um, what I don't like about it, though, is when my mother-in-law hangs off uh, flowers and garlands off the thing because it's in our hallway. And, you know, for her, they're way up high. But whenever I walk into the bedroom, my head gets bonked by these flowers hanging off and stuff. Like <laughs> That's it. great. Yeah, I, I got to go thumbs up. I, I'm probably like a borderline love. Yeah, I, I think we're on, we're on the same page. Okay, and let's do a segment we haven't done in a while. Uh, we ask our listeners to send a voicemail using the little microphone button on our website if they have something to say. And this week we heard from my buddy Jay in Vancouver. Hey, Greg. Hey, Ed. This is Jay from Vancouver, formerly of Bangkok. Super fan of the show. I've never missed an episode. I've been to three Bangkok podcast parties. And I was even on episode 25, dressed as a tuk-tuk driver, eating bugs on the Halloween special. My favorite thing to do with Bangkok taxi drivers is when they quote a price to me, I would then pretend like I didn't understand them and repeat a price double back to them and say, fine, let's go. Then when I get into the taxi, their mind is blown, the smile on their face. I would then just get out, give a big smile and go to the next taxi. Love your show, guys. Keep up the great work. So yeah, Jay, what Jay would do is, oh, he would get into the car and say like, uh, they would say a price, and then he would say something back pretending his tie was pretty bad and give them way more than they should have gotten. And for the for, you know the three or four seconds they thought that they, you know, they had bagged an idiot in the back, he would be like, ha And then he would get out and go to the next taxi. Burn. So Jay's kind of savage like that. He would kind of play games with them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean that that's one way to handle it. Uh, it's funny. We, uh, I, I, I feel that when I first came on the podcast, we talked about taxi culture and taxi strategy a lot. Maybe we need to revisit that. We haven't talked about that in a while. Uh, yeah, yeah, it might be worth a revisit. I mean, you had some really good ideas on how to make it better. So <laughs> that's right, that's <laughs> right. But anyway, Jay, it was good to hear from you, man. Uh, I hope you're doing well. Yeah, thanks for thanks for uh, sending that in, buddy. All right, a final thanks to our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website and connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Toads but goats. You can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us a voicemail through our website that we'll feature on the show, or reach out to me directly on Twitter, where I am BKK Greg. So thank you for listening, everyone, and we will see you back here next week. No doubt. Short, sweet, and positive. That's, right. That's how we like it. That's right. Like me, covered in sugar. All right. <laughs> oh, jeez. All right. <laughs> let's just, let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs>